Welcome um, to those of you uh, here in Atlanta and those of you watching online to the 12th Human Rights Defenders Forum at the Carter Center, organized by our human rights program, led by Laura Olson and our senior advisor, Karen Ryan. The title of our forum this year is Building Solidarity Towards Equality for All. Now, in addition to the human rights defenders and peace builders gathered around this table, these tables, we have some special guests joining today whom I'd like to welcome and acknowledge. First, the Inspector General of Colombia, Mr. Fernando Carrillo. Inspector General, there you are. Thank you. Welcome. The Minister for Human Rights of Punjab in Pakistan, Mr. Ijaz Masi. The representative of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Mr. Ben Majakadunmi. And I'd like to recognize several uh, consuls general based in Atlanta, Mr. Javier Diaz de Leon from Mexico, uh, Mr. Peter Zimmerle from Switzerland, Mr. Art van der Voorst from the Netherlands, Mr. Uh, Young Jun Kim of South Korea, and Ms. Charlotte Magenda representing Germany. We're meeting here at a time when human rights and democratic movements in every region of the world are both under threat and also heroically on the rise. Authoritarian leaders have taken the reins of power in places where we all believed great progress had been made. And what bothers me personally is not only the rise in the numbers of authoritarian uh, rulers, but the increasing respectability that they enjoy. Crackdowns on dissent and free expression are growing in alarming ways, and institutions designed to protect and advance democracy and human rights are showing the strain. Violent conflicts at the local and regional levels have spread, and the possibility of major power conflict thought to be a relic of earlier decades and centuries, is back on the table and in the news. However, those of you gathered here today and many thousands of others throughout the world are responding with determination and awe-inspiring bravery to these dark trends. For the last three days, you've been in discussions here at the Carter Center about the challenges facing those who work toward the realization of the Universal Declaration for Human Rights Promise of all human rights for all. We're learning from each other how we can stand up for these most basic human values and stand together, especially with those of you placing yourselves in harm's way. Now this meeting today will be a little different in format uh, than in previous years. After our musical offering, which I will introduce in a moment, President Carter will offer remarks on the challenges for human rights and peace in these difficult times. And following President Carter, our Human Rights Program Director, Laura Olson, will present a brief summary of the previous day's uh, discussions and deliberations. For the rest of the day, the meeting will be a conversation featuring all of you. We want to hear your ideas for creating more united and effective human rights and peace movements that will result in solidarity and support and therefore greater effectiveness. Now before I introduce President Carter, we will, as we always do, begin with music to kick off our time together. Today's performance will feature two women with a special connection to President Carter and the Carter Center. Karen Ryan and Emma Salahuddin, who will tell her story in a moment. Now, Karen has been with the Carter Center since 1988, and I'm sure all of you know Karen. But in 1999, she took a creative detour to study writing and production at the Berkeley College of Music. After the attacks on the United States on September 11th, 2001, Karen returned to the center and began organi organizing the Human Rights Defenders Forum because of the threats uh, to human rights that emerged uh, during that time. We all thought it was about time Karen shared one of her, orig her original songs with us, 
which she started 16 years ago. So Karen and Emma will perform a song called Everybody's Praying, which Karen tells me she wrote in one sitting on September 12th, 2001. And now over to Emma Salahuddin. Okay, this is a personal message to President Carter. My name is Emma Salahuddin, and in the summer of 1966, I met President Carter at the Governor Honors Program held at Wesleyan College at Macon, Georgia. This was the first year that 20 black students out of 500 students total were admitted to the program. Many were opposed to our admittance, including the governor at that time, Lester Maddox, who showed up with members of the KKK in protest. However, President Carter who was the keynote speaker at the welcoming program, was there to help to calm the troubled waters for us 20 black high school juniors and seniors. Every student had earned the right to be there based on studious merits and academic achievements. Therefore, President Carter was there front and center to make sure that all 500 students entered that auditorium without incident. I will never forget his kind and welcoming words to each and every one of us as he spoke that day. So it is an honor and a blessing today to be able to say to you, President Carter, in person, thank you for your actions 53 years ago. Thank you for your wonderful presidency and thank you for your continued service as a caring humanitarian. Thank you. <laughs> this is the didgeridoo. Uh -huh. <laughs> temples to worship him ask forgiveness for our sins giving thanks that we've been shown the one true path to reach heaven's home
this great nation of the wealth untold. Where lives and dreams can be bought and sold. The prayers rise up from rich and He said, love thy neighbor as thyself. The poor might trust to those with wealth. No man, no king.
everybody's praying. Wow. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Emma. Now, um, while President Carter needs absolutely no introduction, I will just say that I know I speak for all of you in expressing how grateful we are to have with us the man who placed human rights at the center of the foreign policy of the United States of America who signed the major UN human rights treaties establishing firmly the interdependence of civil and political rights with economic, social, and cultural rights, who prioritized women's rights and the appointment of women to positions of leadership while he was in the White House and ever since, and who showed us how we might do all these things while also waging peace, preventing war, and eschewing violence. President Carter. Oh, I'm sorry. I was overwhelmed with the tune and the lyrics of that beautiful song that I just heard. Last week I was in Nashville, Tennessee, helping to build homes for poor people. And one of the nights, we were entertained by Garth Brooks and Tricia Yearwood. And they had brought to the Bluebird Cafe three of their fellow songwriters. And um, I was just thinking then, they'd be better off if they had Karen. Every now and then I teach uh, Sunday school, and while we're worshiping the Prince of Peace, I sometimes remind my class that the United States of America, a country of which I'm proud, has been in existence for 243 years, since 1776. Of those 243, we've been at war 227 of those years. And the United States have been at peace for only 16 years. So we worship the Prince of Peace. Everyone is praying, but nobody's listening to what God is saying. It was and then 16 years ago when we had our first assembly in this series of human rights defenders, it was a few months after the 9-11 attack on the United States when about 3,000 people were killed in just a few moments. 
and we had all the human rights defenders assembled here were watching very closely about what had happened to human rights since that tragic event. We had already observed that the transfer of attention to the so-called war on terror was reducing tremendously the worldwide commitment to human rights and to democracy itself and also to other symbols of human rights and democracy like honest and fair elections to be held in countries and independent judiciaries and I would say particularly a free press. But we had observed that our prediction that this would continue a downward trend in all these facets of life has come to be true. And now we find ourselves a relatively small group of courageous human rights defenders in an attitude of consternation and sometimes even despair about what we can do concerning this lowering the standards of human rights and the attention paid to women activists in particular and to the gross abuse that has resulted, as Marianne said, in a great increase in authoritarian governments that are becoming much more defensive not only of people from foreign countries, but also from opposing political parties. And the gross personal attacks on one another and the sharp divisions that have come to exist in many countries that hadn't known it before have become increasingly troubled. I know all of you were sent a survey form before you got here. And most of my rambling speech notes are taken from comments made on those survey forms. I know you've been having extensive discussions here, not only about the tragic circumstances that we find to be a trend in the entire world, but especially tr troublesome in places like the Dominican, uh, like the government of uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo and in Colombia, whose representatives are here, and also the Palestinians. Colombia has suffered hundreds of losses of life in the last two years, according to the United Nations. And we, the Carter Center has been directly involved in a, an effort in the Dominican Republic, excuse me, in the Democratic Republic of Congo to give all the people in that country a fair access to the wealth that comes from their treasures that God gave them in the earth. And we know that the Palestinians have suffered increasingly from human rights abuses now for years, even decades. And the situation seems to be worse now than it ever was. So all of us, I think, would recognize without question or contradiction that we face tremendous opposition to truth and to justice and to democracy and freedom and human rights. I would say substantially because the United States overreacted in a long, wrong way to the unjustified attack on our Twin Towers. 
So the question arises in my mind, and I'm sure yours, and has for the last few days, what are we going to do about it? Well, we don't have much authority. The human rights defenders don't because many of them, I would say particularly the women and girls, have been excluded from the political process deliberately by authoritarian leaders who have taken over the governments now in many countries and who are thriving. But what can we do just ourselves? And that is a basic question that we want to answer during this remaining session. And I hope that you'll be very bold and uh, innovative in providing Laura and Karen and Marianne and me and others your advice on what is the best way to address this serious challenge to our way of life. One of the foundations of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, almost in every paragraph, is equality. The treatment of equal people equally by each other and by human beings. And the following of the great religions on earth, Christianity and Judaism and Hinduism, Islam, and those were all addressed very carefully back in the, after the half of the 1940s had gone by when the Second World War was over. And I would say that for the only time in human history that a group of enlightened leaders who had helped to defeat Nazism in Germany came together, about 45 of them, and searched their hearts and souls. And the scholars who advised them and derived from that group and from those sources the finest set of simple rules that became 30 paragraphs in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And we are now witnessing on a global basis almost in every area of the world that very disturbing deterioration. And I would like to ask all of you in the next few hours to give all of us who will be putting this document together your recommendations. And I've made arrangements for some of you to go to Washington and talk to some of the American leaders. And you need to find ways to talk to your own political and cultural leaders as well. So I wish you well. I'm very proud of what has been done in preparation for my appearing. And uh, I hope that we'll all be courageous enough to take bold steps, including perhaps a, uh, a way to communicate instantly with each other by the internet and a, a commitment at least to let the Carter Center and others know whenever there is a serious violation of democracy, freedom, or human rights. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Carter. Uh, now I'd like to ask Laura Olson to present a brief summary of your deliberations so far to inform the discussion President Carter referred to for uh, the rest of our the rest of our forum. Laura. Thank you, Ambassador Peters. 
President Carter. What surfaced immediately in the conversation is that solidarity begins with a simple concept. You, we, are not alone. During the past three and a half days, our guests, these human rights defenders and peace builders from 28 countries gathered here at the Carter Center have had spirited, sometimes difficult, always enlightening conversations about how to define solidarity. But more importantly, how to strengthen and sustain networks and support systems that make a real impact in radically different contexts around the world. The theme of the 12th Annual Human Rights Defenders Forum, Building Solidarity Towards Equality for All, has a special resonance in a troubling geopolitical climate in which human rights and human dignity are under attack. To put things in stark perspective, Muna Lukman, founder and chairperson of Food for Humanity in Yemen, reminded us that some human rights defenders do not have the luxury of spending time debating such issues. In 15 minutes we have been in this session, at least five children have died in Yemen. The women's movement in Yemen began at the grassroots level, Muna said, when wives and mothers realized nobody is going to save us. As was referenced during the discussions, President Carter has said, addressing violence and discrimination against women and girls is the most serious human rights challenge of our time. He also said that by elevating a critical mass of women to positions of leadership, the many other challenges we face, climate change, war, poverty, and inequality, will be more readily solved. Solidarity begins with individuals, and it grows in ever-expanding circles to the community, the nation, and ultimately the globe. At every level, human rights defenders must be supported, celebrated, and protected. Though the context varied dramatically from country to country, several common themes emerged this week. Human rights interventions should be holistic, encompassing civil and political rights, as well as economic and social rights. The greatest threat to all humanity is climate change, posing both an enormous risk and opportunity for us to finally address the root causes of inequality and injustice through innovation and inclusion. True solidarity requires that we act in concert to support people's campaigns, particularly the youth, rising up to confront these, this existential challenge, while at the same time building human rights respecting societies. To achieve this, various strategies were discussed to concentrate on improving the institutions with greatest impact on the lives of human rights defenders. Many cited strengthening local and national judiciaries as an urgent priority so that human rights violators are held accountable. Impunity for abusers results in more attacks. Strengthening global responses to attacks against human rights defenders and peace builders is also necessary and is an important form of solidarity. Developed democracies that purport to prioritize the advancement of human rights often fail to translate that into meaningful action, leaving activists to face the risks alone. Funding mechanisms should be more responsive to the needs of defenders and peace builders, given the challenging environments in which they work. But we also heard repeatedly that moral support is just as important as financial support to defenders on the ground. Amplifying voices of activists through the media and through forums like this can be a lifeline. Ramesh Sharma, coordinator of a people's movement, Ekta Parishad, 
a people's movement for land rights in India that ha now has 250,000 active members, sees each individual victory as a work in progress. Every campaign, every action is just one step on the ladder, he said. Human rights defenders are helping to build that ladder every day. Colleen Wessel McCoy, who has worked for 20 years at the intersection of religion and social transformation in the United States, reminded us of the fragile nature of progress. After achieving the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his fellow activists realized that these huge victories had not translated to economic rights. Colleen said, because they were not matched with economic and cultural and social rights, those civil and political rights were ephemeral. And so 50 years later, these rights again are under attack. Solidarity is not about feeling abandoned. It's about feeling protected and supported. It's also about keeping hope alive through all the risks and sacrifices. Solidarity is not about me, it's about we, said Stacey Hopkins, a voting rights advocate here in Atlanta. She said, it's about just being there, not being ahead of someone or behind somebody, but standing with them. <laughs> and those of us at the Carter Center who spent these days with you, we are proud to stand with all of you the frontline defenders of human rights and peace around the world. In addition to this summary, President Carter, we want you to hear, to be able to hear directly from the human rights defenders. So we will open the floor to hear from our guests. While they, I would ask those that wish to speak to tilt their placard up like this. And while you're thinking about what you might want to say, I'm gonna do one quick announcement. Um, that is a reminder for those of us in the room, but it may be the first time for those of us watching in line to hear this. And that is that President Carter has agreed to do a question and answer session at the end of the day. Um, so please submit any questions, whether online or here in the room by 3.15 today. Um, if you are here in the room, the basket where we're collecting those questions is in the foyer outside, just outside the doors. So, I see there's some placards up. Muna, would you like to begin? Thank you. So I greet you with the greeting of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be upon you all. I'm honored to be here today in the presence of the legendary world peace leader, former President Jimmy Carter, who once said, our commitment to human rights must be absolute, our laws fair, our national beauty preserved. The powerful must not perse persecute the weak and human dignity must be enhanced. I'm also proud to be among these courageous human rights defenders from around the world, working tirelessly to defend our freedoms and rights. And we thank the, Car the Carter Center for creating this impor important space for us so that we can continue our strive for human dignity, equality, and justice. I came to you today with heartbreaking messages from the people of Yemen. <clears throat> Warring parties in Yemen to the conflict have exasperated what the UN has called the world's largest humanitarian catastrophe. <clears throat> As the world celebrates tomorrow, the World Food Day, my people starve to death. And as humanitarians, we start to see the famine everywhere including people who are eating leaves because they have no other source of food. Yemen is the forgotten war 
that in spite of mounting evidence of violations of international law by the parties of the conflict, accountability remains inadequate. And as the world celebrates the United Nations Day, my people do not believe in human rights anymore. Your Excellency, President Carter and fellow human rights defenders, with my sisters, I co-founded one of the largest women's networks called the Women's Solidarity Network with Yemeni women inside and outside of the country. As a network, we decided that our priority is, a fir is first to work to protect each other. And our second um, priority, we will work to um, push for women's participation, rights, and gender equality. And third, we came together to contribute to peace building. We supported the US Congress to pass the legislation to halt arms transfers. But in addition to urgently needed disarmament in Yemen and the region, we are also calling for inclusive peace processes of all political actors in society, groups, including women and youth, as well as supporting transitional justice not only to bring accountability to perpetrators and militias, violating and abusing international humanitarian law, but also to support reparation and reconciliation efforts to mend a deeply fragmented society. It is time for the greatest country in the world to work towards creating a peace-driven economy instead of a weapons-based economy. The Middle East does not need any weapons flow if we really have a real shot towards sustainable peace. A peace-driven, progress, progressive US policy is what is needed in our country now. And we urge you, President Carter, to exert pressure and stand in solidarity for the children of Yemen who deserve life. Thank you. Thank you, Luna. I see. Wassam, I saw your placard up. President Carter, it's an honor to be here with you today. My name is Wassam Ahmed, and I'm here on behalf of Al Haq, the first Palestinian human rights organization to whom you awarded the Reebok Human Rights Award 30 years ago in this very venue. Although the prospects for a just and peaceful resolution to the conflict uh, may seem more distant than ever, your non-wavering support continues to give us hope. Your tenure as President of the United States of America set the bar for the use of power in a virtuous manner that was reflective of true American values. As a Palestinian American, it saddens me to see these values under threat today and the notion of the virtuous use of power being eroded. It is no coincidence that these concerns coincide with a broader crisis in the legitimacy of the International Human Rights Project, as the pursuit of dignity for all has been replaced with a dignity for some at the expense of others. Evidence of this crisis can be seen not only in the developing world or just in Palestine, but within these very borders it has become clear that the situation in Palestine is a microcosm of global injustice, and we are confident that by working together to achieve dignity for all, dignity for the Palestinian people will also be achieved. Global conflict, poverty, racism, and climate change are only some of the challenges facing humanity today. Despite the current bleakness for the prospects of the future, we maintain faith in humanity's ability to turn adversity into innovation and use that innovation for the benefit of all. The Carter Center is an ember that provides a glimmer of light in the darkness confronting human rights defenders around the world today, giving us optimism that the fire of virtue can always be rekindled to bring back the light and serve as a beacon for hope, no matter how difficult the situation may seem today. Thank you, President Carter, for keeping hope alive. Thank you for the staff of the center for preserving this institution with the hope that 
in the future people will speak of Atlanta as they speak of Florence and the new renaissance for humanity emerging from here. In order to show our gratitude, I would like to present you with this handmade gift from the Friends of Birzet Cooperative that support students in need, investing in the young problem solvers for tomorrow. Thank you for all your efforts. God bless you, and God bless humanity. Thank you. Thank you, and God bless the Palestinians and their cause for justice. Thank you. Colleen? So the little oh. picture of the person face, talking. the yeah. person talking. Yeah. Thank you. I'm new here. Um, <laughs> My name is Colleen Wessel McCoy. Um, I'm actually from Georgia. Uh, my husband's from Illinois, the land of Lincoln, and we tease in my household that I'm from the land of Carter. Um, in King's last years, he was forming a poor people's campaign. Uh, and we're taking that vision up again today in the United States with a poor people's campaign, a national call for moral revival. And so in 1968, King said that he was moving from a civil rights movement to build a human rights movement, and those around him called for that, and taking on the evils of poverty, racism, and war as inseparable from each other, and saw that it had to really be a human rights movement. Uh, he said to really make meaningful the gains that they had made in the civil rights movement, that economic and social rights must be fulfilled as well. And so he pulled together the poor, the leaders of the poor, from across racial and ethnic lines, from across the country. And they actually met at Pascal's, not far from here, and said, when he spoke to him, spoke to that group of, of poor leaders across racial lines, said, being in a room like this has been a dream of mine. It's never happened before. And together we can build the power of the poor, and we can really build a human rights movement he was killed three weeks later, and the Poor People's Campaign did go on. Uh, it was an important moment in our history in 1968. But today, we are still fighting to really fulfill the, the human rights in the United States. We have fewer voting rights than we did 50 years ago. Greater inequality, more military spending, a disastrous environmental crisis, and all of this to, is tied together by distorted moral narratives and religious narratives that, that say terrible things about the poor and divide us from one another. And so the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, is in 40 states, and we're coming to Washington, D.C. in June of next year. And we would be so grateful if you would share on social media and on Twitter about the campaign and about the work we're doing to build a human rights movement and really take on the relationship of, of poverty, racism, military spending, the environmental devastation, and the distorted moral narrative. And we, we see ourselves as, as working in the, in the spirit of human rights and working in the spirit of your work and are, are grateful for the, the path before us. Stacy, yeah. Um, this is quite a moment for me. Um, I'm a simple woman, and I never expected to be in a room like this before. But um, I want to say thank you to President Carter. Um, if I could have voted in 1976, I was only 13. I would have voted for you. Um, <laughs> but very thankful that we had you as a president and I'm thankful to be sitting in this room and quite honored. Um, I sit here um, bringing the spirit of Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker with me and like Fannie, I am tired, but I'm not tired of fighting. And I'm so thankful because I'm not tired of fighting because you 
my Congressman John Lewis, Fanny, Ella, so many names, all of you have taught me to do what I did. And what I did was in 2017, the state of Georgia and Fulton County, Georgia, attempted to purge myself and over 380,000 voters. Um, that was something that was of great offense to me and, of course, a serious human rights violation because it undercut the foundation of our guiding principles of this country of one person, one vote. That experience set a fire in me because even though I was deeply, deeply offended and I was deeply troubled about the political environment here in Georgia, I was determined to fight back and I did. However, my fight has not ended. And just as the other Stacy, they put two Stacys in the room together, double trouble, um, talked about the Poor People's Campaign and the uh, turnaround that Dr. King was making. He understood that voting rights had to be done first before we could attempt to launch something as a Poor People's Campaign. We still have a state of emergency here in Georgia. On August 6th, I stood with a man named Ronaldo Pearson, representing a group, uh, Represent U.S., and he began a trek from Atlanta, Georgia, to Washington, D.C., to bring a message of a state of democracy. I stood with him. I still stand with him, but I also bring a message. We definitely have a state of emergency here in Georgia. And while I do not want to focus too much on the suffering, I want to look towards what we can do because I do not want any other person in Georgia or the rest of the world to face what we faced here in Georgia, particularly in the 2018 election cycle. There are remedies that we can bring to end the suffering, ending winner-take-all voting, and moving to more systems such as ranked choice voting, getting rid of suppressive forms of voter suppression such as at-large voting, changing uh, simple remedies such as vote by mail, Instead of running around, trying, we watched purges, which, of which I was involved in, and which we did get some relief with the uh, HB 316 bill that was passed that, um, because of my case, forced changes as to how we did voter maintenance. We still have a problem with precinct closures, and there is a simple remedy called vote by mail, which is used by very many states around the world. So I want to spend my time and my whatever time I have left here um, working towards making sure that no one endures what I or others. And sitting this conference, being a part of this wonderful forum and meeting all of my cousins from 28 countries who I never knew, you gave us one hell of a family reunion. And I thank you so much for that. Thank you, Stacy. So, well, since we're on this side of the room, Carol, would you like? Carol. Carol? She'll be speaking in French. She'll be speaking in French. Euh, merci. Bonjour, euh, honorable président Carter. C'est un privilège pour moi de vous parler. Je suis Carole Faïla, je viens de la RDC. Et je suis très émue de constater que la RDC est restée au cœur de vos préoccupations puisque vous l'avez dit tout à l'heure. Cela m'a vraiment ému Et quand je vais rentrer chez moi, je vais rassurer à toute ma famille, à toute la société civile congolaise et à toutes les femmes pour qui nous nous battons, qui souffrent 
des impacts négatifs de l'exploitation des ressources naturelles, je vais leur rassurer que le président Jimmy Carter reste solidaire avec nous. Merci beaucoup. Et je voudrais ici, au nom de la RDC tout entière, marquer notre gratitude envers le Centre Carter et également envers vous, cher président Jimmy Carter, pour votre implication pour la promotion et la défense des droits de l'homme en RDC. Vous avez accompagné la RDC pendant plusieurs processus électoraux. Vous avez soutenu les organisations de la société civile congolaise sur les questions de gouvernance des ressources extractives. D'aucuns ici n'ignorent que la RDC est un pays scandaleusement riche en ressources naturelles. Mais malheureusement, jusqu'à ce jour, la population est demeurée scandaleusement pauvre. Ceci est une chanson qui est chantée depuis des générations et vous n'avez pas cessé de vous impliquer pour que cette situation change. Nous vous sommes reconnaissantes et nous gardons espoir qu'un jour, cette chanson va changer. Qu'au lieu de dire scandaleusement riche et scandaleusement pauvre en termes de population et de richesse, la chanson va changer pour qu'on dise que les, les populations de la RDC sont scandaleusement riches à cause de leur richesse. Nous gardons espoir et nous pensons que votre solidarité, comme nous l'avons si bien euh, discuté pendant quelques jours que nous avons passé ici, que cela va nous apporter ces changements et nous gardons espoir. Une autre innovation que nous avons constatée, nous, la société civile, c'est que le Centre Carter a apporté son soutien aux organisations féminines, les organisations féminines qui se battent pour que les femmes qui souffrent de cette inégalité, de cette injustice sociale, avec cette exploitation minière, cette exploitation des pétroles, il y a des femmes qui se battent pour que la situation change. Nous avons vu que le Centre Carter a apporté son soutien technique comme financier à nous, les organisations féminines. Nous sommes très reconnaissants. Et nous prions que le Centre Carter, cela est notre demande, puisse pérenniser cette action en impliquant davantage des organisations féminines qui militent pour cette cause, afin que ces femmes et ces enfants, afin que la population en général puisse désormais bénéficier de cette richesse, afin que la corruption qui gangrène les institutions, afin que la corruption qui empêche à ce que les ressources naturelles puissent profiter aux populations puisse prendre fin. Nous demandons que le Centre Carter pérennise son action et que Dieu vous bénisse, cher Président Carter. Que Dieu vous bénisse. Merci. Merci, Carl. Inspector General Carillo. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much. Hey, Ambassador Peters, Laura, Jenny, all the people involved in the organization in this forum. First of all, I want to tell you, Mr. President, that you have been key in the support of the peace process in Colombia, and thank you for this cooperation. When I was Minister of the Interior in 2012, you went to Colombia and you offered the support to the peace process. And as you know, five years after we are in front of one of the biggest challenges in Colombia, which is peace building and peacekeeping. And always the Carter Center is at the center of the preoccupations uh, at the international support for our leaders and the role play, but the main actors in this peace building are precisely the social leaders of Colombia. That's why, Mr. President, I believe that when you bring 
the concept of solidarity to the epicenter of the reflection in this forum. I have to tell you that solidarity is always a public responsibility. Solidarity is not only an individual concept, a commitment for individuals apart from the state. That's why this readiness for mutual support and a mutual aid for, the hum for human rights and peace and development is basically derived from human dignity. I use it many times. Solidarity has been, has been considered as charity, sympathy, altruism, but basically today solidarity should be respect for human and fundamental rights. And I'm sure because I've been involved with the Carter Center in different activities for the last 20 years that, as you mentioned before, independence of the judiciary is one of the key issues for the guaranteeing promotion and defense of human rights. We need institutional spaces at the local level, at the international level. As you know, we have the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, but we need justice working very closely to the citizen at the local level, as many people have been saying at this forum. You mentioned that universality, indivisibility, interdependence of human rights means like in continents like Africa and Latin America, inequality is the most daunting and challenging task. And this is why uh, fighting against inequality is not only an economic and social challenge, but an ethical challenge. And you have been, Mr. President, a point of reference for public ethics throughout the world. And this is very important. I believe there is a lack of integrity, a lack of transparency in the management of the state, and it's about time to start working in this area. In a crisis, solidarity is a kind of thermometer, shows the best faces of people, and I want to mention what's going on in Colombia with 1,500,000 Venezuelans entering the country. We have, Mr. President, 1,300 Venezuelans entering each day, every day, the Colombian territory. And we have shown the best faces, and I was mentioned to Ambassador Peters a few minutes ago, that we're proud of what we have been doing in Colombia as a, as a solidarian with the, with, the, with the Venezuelan people. We had a problem with 27 babies that were born in Colombian territory. And because of the Colombian legislation, because of the rigidities of the Colombian legislation, we were not allowed to give them Colombian nationality. They were in kind of stateless condition, what we call in, in Spanish apatridia, without nationality, sin nacionalidad. And we decided to make some changes in the legislation. And two months ago, uh, the Office of the Inspector Attorney General, my office, jointly with the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Office of the President, we decided to change the conditions for the nationality. It was a, just a technical discussion, but to show the international community that it's possible to, to be in solidarity with the vulnerable people, with these babies, and these 27,000 babies are now Colombians. And th this is a good example of we, what we can do, because uh, I, I was telling them in a, in a previous meeting that we are in, in electoral process in Colombia. Normally, when you are in elections, all the bad sentiments uh, arise. And we have been, from my office, uh, telling, warning the candidates, the parties, that it's impossible to use language against the Venezuelan migrants in this point. Just to make a comparison, you have to take into account that these million uh, 500 Venezuelans are exactly the, the same amount of Syrians to the whole Europe, to the whole Europe, to the whole European continent in the last years. But we have been building a, a social structure system. We have been asking for international cooperation because it's not only a Colombian problem. Uh, other countries in the region uh, don't have the same attitude, but this is not our problem. But anyway, we have shown that the respect and the minimal uh, human rights should be respected for our, for our uh, migrant people. That's why solidarity creates social cohesion and 
and for the peace building and the, and the peace, peacekeeping uh, social leaders activities in Colombia is a fundamental concept. As you know, violence and, and violations of human rights are common against social leaders in Colombia. As you know, not only the killings of hundreds of social leaders during the last three years after the, after the signature of the peace accord, but always the, the possibility of working with the state, because uh, I, I want to mention again the, the, the justice system, the possibility of doing a lot within the justice system in Colombia, the possibility of the investigations, of clarifying the crimes, of avoiding uh, a stigmatization. I've been saying that stigmatization is a kind of a down payment of assassination in, in Colombia. So we have to stop that kind of language that we have a campaign with precisely with the uh, USAID, the Office of International Aid of the United States, in order to tell the Colombians that it's possible to, to have the Venezuelans uh, and foreign people in the country with basic needs fulfilled. And finally, Mr. President, I want to mention a point which I believe is very important and is the issue of corruption. Corruption is right now in our continents the most important engine for violation of human rights. Corruption is a problem that is in the direction of violation rights are like uh, health, education, environment, housing. So not only the international conventions, the Inter-American Convention Against Corruption and the UN Convention are important instruments for uh, fighting and for pr protecting and defending human rights. And I just want to mention this because in our work together with the Carter Center, we are including this variable as one of the topics that is key for the Colombian future. Solidarity means to recognize the importance of promoting and defending the rights of children, protection of the environment, the intercultural dimension that my colleague from Colombia, Patricia Tobón, has been mentioning always as a member of the Truth Commission in Colombia. She will talk uh, later about this issue. The issue of ethnic mi minorities. And I'm finishing just telling you that the cornerstone for fighting poverty in our region is basically this interdependence between economic, and social, economic, social, and cultural rights, and of course, the basic political rights. But I believe the issue is ethics, Mr. President, and you have been the cornerstone for that public policy throughout the world. So when some, uh, some people are saying that the U.S. Uh, demo, democracy, U.S. Uh, diplomacy is in, in, a, in a status of demolition, as Foreign Affairs Magazine says this week, uh, the hope continues to be you and the Carter Center. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you. I will call on Patricia next. I'm just giving her a little heads up to get ready. Um, but I'd also like to say we're all so very interested, and those watching online, to hear about your work, your suggestions. How can human rights defenders be better protected? So as much as we appreciate the expressions of gratitude, um, we would certainly like to hear what are the innovative and bold ideas that President Carter you know, asked to hear from you in his opening remarks. Um, to save time, because unfortunately it's <laughs> passing very quickly. We're going to have to only probably have time for one or two more speakers in this session. Um, so Patricia will be speaking in Spanish, so those of you who need interpretation, please put on your headsets. Thank you, Patricia. Quiero dar las gracias al Presidente Carter por su compromiso eh, con los derechos humanos. Soy indígena del pueblo en Vera, de Colombia, eh, donde los pueblos indígenas y afros nos juntamos en una comisión interétnica para la resolución de conflictos territoriales y la construcción de la paz. Y juntos, decididamente, decidimos participar en la construcción del proceso de paz. Y quiero agradecer porque gracias a, a la lucha que han dado eh, la sociedad estadounidense por los derechos civiles, 
eh, muchísimas de las personas de Estados Unidos nos acompañaron en que tanto el gobierno de Colombia como las FARC abrieran un capítulo especial para los pueblos indígenas y afrocolombianos, uno de los sectores más afectados por el conflicto armado colombiano. Y hoy el Acuerdo de Paz tiene un capítulo especial fruto de esas reflexiones y de ese apoyo y de ese compromiso también de quienes en este país han acompañado eh, lo que ha sido la lucha por esos deber, derechos civiles de las comunidades afroamericanas que tanto también en Colombia requerimos que se reconozcan eh, a los pueblos indígenas afros y a las sociedades más excluidas y empobrecidas. Eh, quiero decir también que ese proceso hizo que hoy en Colombia eh, un órgano como la Comisión para el Esclarecimiento de la Verdad, la Convivencia y la No Repetición tuviera una representante indígena como yo dentro de este proceso para eh, aclarar y para ayudar a encontrar cuáles han sido esas causas que han generado un conflicto histórico y cíclico en nuestro país. Yo quiero decir también que en Colombia eh, hay en este momento una cifra muy grande de asesinatos a líderes sociales eh, y defensores de derechos humanos, cuatro, cinco, cuatro, eh, 415 personas, como lo reporta la Procuraduría General de la Nación, y 130 excombatientes que suscribieron el proceso de paz han sido asesinados. Y quisiéramos pedirle, Presidente Carter, toda su reflexión para que Estados Unidos mantenga la política de la paz y pueda analizar y valorar los aprendizajes que ha dejado los procesos de militarización en Colombia eh, y los análisis también alrededor de la intervención de la política de drogas. Al respecto, quisiéramos que, que se pueda mantener la palabra de Estados Unidos en, en ampliar y en seguir haciendo una reflexión sobre los derechos civiles, la importancia de avanzar en una justicia social, en la resolución de los conflictos de manera pacífica, en, en el fortalecimiento de una justicia incluyente en muchos territorios donde el Estado Nacional no ha llegado en Colombia y también en la importancia de seguir fortaleciendo las iniciativas de los líderes y comunidades que construyen la paz en Colombia, por la que, digamos, hoy el proceso de paz eh, sigue vivo en esos territorios y de lo cual esperamos no solamente un apoyo, sino que de verdad Estados Unidos mantenga también unos esfuerzos anteriores que ayudaron también a construir este proceso de paz y a que no haya retroceso en esa política. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Patricia. And please turn off your microphones if you're no longer speaking. That the person speaking is the yeah. Otherwise, we'll get some echo echoing. So thank you, Patricia. That's going to conclude our first session, and I know. You would like to go to lunch now, but before you get to eat, we need your full cooperation to take a group photo in five minutes or less. So please do not begin conversations at your table. While I'm giving the instructions, Brandon's going to get the stage ready. So I'd like you to not begin conversations at your table, but take off your name tags.